everybody. So um, we've got a, a pretty nice overview of the basic principles on secondary structure prediction this morning in, in Evo's presentations, uh, presentation. And um, now I'm going to uh, show you um, how we can actually um, improve secondary structure predictions or the um, the drawbacks that Ivo already mentioned in his presentation before. How can we improve on, uh, on all the remaining issues that might appear if we still want to uh, stay on the, um, on the abstraction of secondary structures, but um, want, uh, if we want to get um, s slightly better secondary structures um, out of our uh, implemented programs. So, um, first of all, um, you, um, you might recall the, the uh, there. You might recall these um, first three bullet points that I that I put on uh, up there. So. Um, yeah, secondary structure prediction. We have seen that um, um, the basic recursion and the um, and the algorithms that we can build upon them um, they typically run in cubic time complexity. Um, they are um, so to say quite fast. Yeah, but. Um, the, um, the accuracy for, for the predictions, especially minimum free energy predictions, they are uh, mostly only accurate um, for quite small RNA. So the longer the RNA gets um, or the RNA becomes, the uh, worse the predictions become. And Ivo already uh, mentioned why that is so, yeah, because um, the longer the RNA becomes, the more optimal structures you, ca uh, you have to choose from. Yeah, so um, now, um, if, if you if you're faced with this uh, with this kind of problem, you can try to uh, ask yourself, um, yeah. So why is this so? Um, what can uh, yeah, so what, what can be the, um, the, the actual underlying problems why the predictions um, are getting worse yeah, for particular RNAs? And um, if you, if you um, think about that um, a little bit longer, you can, um, you can come up with some ideas. Yeah? For example, you could say, okay, um, it, maybe the, the entire prediction model is quite good, but the energy parameters that have, have been experimentally determined, they consist of um, certain experimental errors and so on and so forth, and therefore, maybe with better energy parameter sets, um, we would get better predictions. So this, uh, this could be one solution on how to make um, structure predictions better. Um, then um, Ivo also mentioned that extens uh, uh, mentioned that before. Um, the the um, ionic conditions of the RNA, yeah, they are not. Um, they are usually not uh, reflected in the uh, in the prediction uh, algorithms. Yeah? So um, we usually neglect the magnesium concentrations. Yeah, we have these arti uh, artificially high potassium concentrations where the energy parameters have been determined from. And so maybe if we would uh, would be able to include ion uh, ion concentrations, we would get better predictions. Yeah? Um, what you could also think of is that um, maybe since we um, since we compute, for example, minimum free energy structures, yeah, maybe the minimum free energy structure is not the native state, yeah, and um, so how can we uh, how can we actually try to find the native state? Yeah, we could think of guiding the pr prediction towards the native state. Yeah, so we can um, distort the energies maybe a li little bit and uh, therefore predict a structure that would not be the minimum free energy structure in the regular, um, in the regular algorithm, but something quite different. So we might, um, for example, include information from homologous RNAs. We could um, do a comparative analysis. We can compute consensus structures. Um, or we could also use experiments yeah, so we could um, use um, structure probing experiments and take that additional data into our algorithms and then predict um, a secondary structure that um, 
that is quite optimal, um, corresponding to the parameterization of our algorithm and the experimental data. Yeah. And um, if we, so, so these, these are things that we can do with the regular secondary structure um, algorithms that, that we've seen before. Um, but, uh, but sometimes the secondary structure model is off and doesn't reflect what the RNA is actually doing. Yeah? So um, we might also need to extend the secondary structure model, um, for instance, by including pseudonauts. We've seen um, so, uh, some slides before on that. Um, what, uh, what also might be important is um, yeah, we, we, might, uh, we might need to consider additional structure motives. Yeah? So in the secondary structure prediction, we usually only have these base pairs, and they are the canonical Watson-Crick and wobble base pairs, and uh, then we have particular loops that can be formed. But what about all these other uh, possibilities on how base pairing can occur in, uh, in the secondary structure? And uh, what we also usually totally ne neglect are external factors. Evo showed that before, there, there might be some um, small proteins and ligands that bind to the RNA, or there are other RNAs that might bind to the RNA, and we totally neglect them when we predict secondary structures, and it would, uh, could be worthwhile including them in the predictions to, make, uh, to obtain better predictions. But then, um, the, the final um, bullet point that I put here is also something that Ivo just mentioned. Um, if you have a longer RNA yeah, and the RNA is transcribed in the cell, then maybe this, this RNA can never ever reach its ground state or um, something that we could compute as being optimal because, um, because there are dynamic factors, kinetic factors that prevent the structure to actually fold into, um, in, into the ground state that would be optimal under some energetic model or something like that. But we, um, so we um, gonna hear about this very last point um, a lot of um, tomorrow. So let's dive into that and um, let's go to the, um, to the first thing. So I, I will skip um, better energy parameters and ion concentrations here due to time constraints. So um, we, I, I first uh, gonna talk about um, how can we actually guide structure prediction um, to, to, um, to obtain better um, better models of the RNA. So um, let's first have a very quick look at uh, consensus structure prediction. Um, so Ivo, um, I think, uh, Ivo already mentioned that um, with the rRNAs, yeah, so um, if, you, if you have a lot of um, RNA sequences, in that particular case, rRNA sequences, you can look at the covariations of the, of the individual um, sequence positions if you compare different um, homologous RNAs, and then you get a glimpse on um, what Possible, uh, what base pairs are possible for all these different uh, different sequences, and from that you can uh, you can uh, derive a structural model, even without doing any structure prediction um, with the, these dynamic programming recursions that we've seen before. And uh, in fact, this was even done for our RNAs, and, uh, and biologists um, came up with a pretty good picture on how the rRNA actually looks like before they started uh, doing, uh, applying uh, prediction algorithms for, um, for that. And um, if you look at the rRNA structures individually, and you predict a, a secondary structure for that, then you, uh, then you might be, or obtain something that's totally off. Yeah, so something that's totally not um, the, the structure that you would expect. So individual sequences um, might, uh, might lead to, to very bad uh, structural models. And therefore, we, we somehow need an idea on how can we include this um, information that we gain from homologous RNAs into structure prediction. So we um, want to um, consider the potential of structure conservation of all the individual sequences somehow in, in the prediction. Yeah? And uh, we can do that, for instance, by converting this information into something that's more, more or less a guiding potential, something maybe an additional energy contribution that drives our solution into the right direction. Yeah, so 
this, um, this would be the idea. And uh, what, what do we have to keep in mind for doing that? Um, yeah, we, ha we have to keep in mind that um, if we have different sequences, yeah, there might be uh, mutations. Yeah, if you compare two, uh, a pair of two sequences, um, individual positions might be mutated. And what does it mean if, uh, if a particular uh, position is mutated? Well, um, you can have mutations that, uh, that do not change the possibility of this particular position here to form a base pair. So you can have consistent or compensatory mutations with respect on base pair formation. Yeah, so um, for example, um, this UA, yeah, this A here could be mutated to a G, yeah, then, then uh, still this position here could form a GU base pair, which is still canonical, and therefore the structure can be, uh, can be retained. Yeah? While um, a single mutation can um, very rapidly also uh, change the structure. Yeah? So for, example, uh, for instance, if you change this C here into an A, yeah, then we would need here a GA base pair, which is not part of our model, of our prediction model. And if you would then compute the secondary structure, an optimal secondary structure, there might be something uh, totally different coming out of the predictions. Yeah? And uh, by, by investigating many, many different um, RNA sequences um, and, and analyzing the different mut uh, the mutations on particular sites in these RNAs, uh, um, we, we, yeah, so th this, this is the information that we can um, take out of that. And um, so I, I will not go into, uh, into the depth of how to actually do that. We will hear a lot of, uh, about that on Thursday in Sebastian's pre uh, presentation um, on, on comparative structure modeling. I just want to give you a short overview of how could we actually <coughs> make, uh, do um, the, this kind of predictions. So if we have uh, many, many different sequences, we could say that um, maybe we simply do a sequence alignment for all these sequences and then predict a st secondary structure that's compatible with that particular alignment. Yeah, so we can first align the sequences and then predict the secondary structure and there are a couple of programs that actually follow this paradigm. And uh, the problem with that is that this, uh, this procedure is very sensitive to alignment errors. Yeah, so if you only have um, slight uh, P differences in, in uh, so for example, you, you change um, some, some sequence positions within that alignment, then this might have a very huge impact on, on the secondary structures that you can predict from that alignment. Um, while on the other side, you could also do the, uh, the, the, um, the reverse thing. Yeah? You could first predict secondary structures for the individual sequences and then align the structures that you predicted to get a model that's compatible with all the different sequences. And uh, there are also some programs that do that. And, um, but these pro uh, the, the problem here is that um, this approach is um, very sensitive to prediction errors, of course. Yeah? So if one sequence um, um, is, is uh, I don't know, if you, if you predict um, the secondary structure, let's say the minimum free energy structure for a particular sequence, and this particular sequen, uh, prediction is an outlier among all the different predictions in, that you have, then maybe you never get a, a model that, that quite uh, reflects what, uh, what, what all, your uh, all your sequences can fold into. And then there are, um, then there are um, approaches where you do the prediction of the structure and the alignment simultaneously. And uh, these, um, these approaches follow the, the Sankov algorithm. There are many programs um, that, uh, that are able to, to do that. And in, uh, and the, the last, the fourth um, possibility what, we, uh, what one could do um, is you could do an alignment-free prediction. So you predict um, for all the individual sequences some near optimal, more or less coarse-grained structure. And coarse-grained, by, by coarse-grained, I mean um, you have a helix in the beginning and then you have maybe a, a small hairpin with a helix of a particular size, and then you have a more or less complicated structure for, uh, for, uh, for one particular sequence, then you predict um, the, the structure for all the other sequences, and you, the, uh, and you uh, extract these particular motifs, and uh, from mo many frequent motifs, you start constructing a 
model that fits all of them. Yeah, so, and uh, with this approach, you would never actually align the different sequences with each other, but only look for, um, for, for particular features, app, uh, more complex or abstract features that um, all the different sequences might have in common. Yeah, so, um, but all of these things, um, Sebastian will gonna talk about on, on Thursday. All right. Hmm? Ah, can, could you please pass the microphone? Thank you very much. <laughs> okay, my question is just like, I don't understand really what do you mean by aligning structures. I mean, can you explain what do you mean by? Yeah, so um, in, in principle, yeah, what you, um, let's, let's start with a very simple example. Yeah, so you have um, one sequence yeah, that, um, that maybe has uh, um, uh, forms a um, couple of um, unpaired nucleotides in the beginning, and then there is a helix, small helix, um, and that's the structure for, for uh, one, one of your sequences. And then you have a second sequence, and the second sequence actually starts forming um, a helix here, and then maybe it has um, uh, an unpaired nucleotide here, and particular base pair there, and then um, maybe the, the remainder of the sequence looks like that. Yeah? And by aligning structures, yeah, um, you would try to find an optimal um, alignment of these structures or um, an optimal configuration where you assign um, or you, where you make a mapping of these positions up here in, uh, in structure one to the structure two, the same as in, in sequence alignments. And you would maybe find um, that, um, Let's say yeah, that the, the consensus structure for both of them here, or the aligned structures, is um, you need to insert some gaps in the, in the second structure, in the beginning, and then you have um, these two base pairs, they fit very, uh, they, they could be mapped very well here. Yeah? Then you have a gap here, because, because we have this unpaired position there, and something like that, and then we have um, up here maybe four unpaired nucleotides, down there only three, so we have to have an, a gap in here, and so, and so on and so forth. Yeah, so this would be something like a, uh, like a sequence alignment with these dot bracket strings, yeah, but um, of course more sophisticated uh, methods would simply consider those secondary structures as trees, and then you could make a tree alignment. Yeah, um, to, to actually obtain um, the, the, be, uh, the best or an optimal mapping from one structure to the other. Thank you. Okay, good. Let's proceed to um, to um, to the second part on how can uh, on how to guide secondary structure predictions. And um, in my opinion, this is a very promising thing, um, the, the incorporation of experimental structure probing data. And this is also something that's um, very popular with, uh, or that has been very popular within the last decade or so. Um, this is, um, I, I'm gonna show you um, why, why that is so. Yeah? So um, what is experimental structure probing? Yeah? So um, usually when you, uh, when you uh, talk about experimental secondaries or experimental RNA structure probing, um, what is meant by that is that um, usually you have some chemical or enzymatic probing of the RNA. So you have your RNA in solution, you put in some chemicals or some enzymes, they do something with the RNA and you can somehow obtain where, um, where did a particular chemical um, did, uh, does, no, where did the, the chemical um, maybe modify um, the RNA or where did the, um, pr uh, the enzyme um, cut the RNA. Yeah, so this is, um, this is essentially it. 
So um, some of the, um, there, there are many different um, uh, chemical and enzymatic um, probing approaches, uh, and um, many of them have already been used for a very, very long time. I think even uh, this goes even back into the six, 1960s or so of the, of the last um, century. And so this was way before um, the first secondary structure prediction algorithms um, were um, were developed, and um, most of these uh, most of these probing experiment I, uh, experiments I just mentioned that before um, they specifically modify the RNA or they cut the RNA. They break the backbone of the of the RNA, and. Um, so what you, what you then can have is you, um, you can have um, chemicals that um, target unpaired nucleotides, so uh, nucleotides that are not involved in base pairing, and um, for example with enzymes, that, uh, you could use RNases that specifically cleave um, unpaired nucleotides or um, double-stranded RNA. Yeah? So then you can have a distinction between um, paired and unpaired um, positions of, 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 your, of your structure. And um, so there, there are uh, ribonucleases, these are some enzymes, and then there, you could um, also take uh, LED2, this breaks the backbone, um, then there's CMCT, DMS, shape is very, very popular, um, inline probing where the RNA just degrades itself over time, depending on, on structure and so on and so forth. So there are many, many different approaches on how to, pro uh, how to probe the structure of your RNA in solution. And the general protocol is you simply take your RNA, put in the reagents, um, and then you determine the modification of the cleavage sites. And um, you can do that by gel electrophoresis or um, reverse transcription, maybe high throughput sequencing, and so on and so forth. And uh, from that, you get, um, uh, you, you get the information on which nucleotides um, had been modified. Uh, and from, from this data, you, um, you, you, you need this data uh, and then convert that into something that's more or less a reactivity. So, yeah, so the potential of this particular site to actually be mod uh, become modified. And, um, and this reactivity you then convert into a constraint that, that you can use for your prediction algorithms. And this constraint could be binary. So it could simply say um, this site was unpaired or this site was paired. Yeah? And then you can force your prediction algorithm to uh, obey those rules. Yeah? This can be binary. This can also be a probability, and you can then include the probability. So like 70% um, um, of, of, the, uh, of these nuclear, uh, of these sites um, had been unpaired, and 30% had been unpaired. You can somehow convert that then back into the prediction algorithms to um, uh, to be used, and what you usually then do is you convert those reactivities into something like pseudo energies, energies that you add on top of the energy model that we were talking about before. Yeah. And um, in the end, you then do a manual or a, a computational structure modeling. Yeah. And, um, but what you always have to keep in mind with, uh, I think, almost all of those uh, probing methods is that the signal that you obtain from that is one-dimensional. You get a signal for every individual position of your RNA sequence. You don't, uh, if you know this particular uh, position here is paired, you don't know anything about the pairing partner. Uh, you simply know that this position is paired. All right. Um, this is an... Um, sketch again um, on, on this, this procedure of, of probing. I just mentioned that before, yeah, so you have the, the, um, the, the probing experiment itself. You get, some, um, you get some sequence positions out of that. Um, you convert that into something like a reactivity, and in the end, you, you, um, you end up with the, the structure model. And um, what I'm going to talk about now is um, one particular probing experiment, and this is shape. I won't um, explain um, in detail what, what shape actually does or what shape actually is. Yeah? So this is a, um, a, a, a <coughs> chemical um, probing experiment that, more, uh, that in uh, you know, shape is an abbreviation. This is selective 2-hydroxyl acetyl. Uh, acylation analyzed by primary extension. And in, um, in, in, um, in brief, these, uh, these shape reagents, they simply probe the flexibility of the RNA backbone. 
Yeah, so the more flexible the RNA backbone is, the more likely it is that the shape uh, pr probing uh, molecule can um, attach to the RNA backbone and then modify um, the, 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 um, yeah, the, the RNA at that particular position. Yeah, so it's all about flexibility. And the assumption what, the, uh, what, what people have in mind is usually that um, flexibility means unpairedness. Yeah, so the more flexible, the more likely it is that this position was um, unpaired. Because if it would have been involved in a base pair, then it might be really rigid and not flexible at all. Yeah? And the, the, um, a good, um, or um, uh, yeah, why, why is shape so popular nowadays? Yeah, so many, many of the different um, probing um, chemicals that, they, that have been used before, um, they, they were um, highly biased towards particular nucleotides because they were not um, at, uh, targeting the backbone, but maybe the nucleobases and so on and so forth. And uh, shape is considered to have no nucleo, uh, nucleotide bias at all. Yeah, so this is, uh, this is why this is uh, very popular. And also um, for shape experiments, many protocols have been um, developed where you can use high throughput sequencing. Yeah? So, so you can do probing experiments in high throughput in, um, in, in the laboratory and pr produce tons of data. Um, yeah, and um, the general approach with this um, shape, um, pr um, with the, with the shape project, uh, probing is that you um, get those probing reactivities and then convert them into a pseudo energy term that you simply add on top of the structure prediction. And um, the first who did this was Deegan et al. in, uh, et al. in, in 2009. And they simply said, okay, we, 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 probe this, um, we, we probe this RNA structures, we get this reactivity and um, the higher the reactivity is, the more likely it is to be um, unpaired. Yeah. And so if we consider a secondary structure like that, we could simply add additional penalizing terms to each of these stacks that are formed during the prediction and say um, the, uh, this penalizing term here um, is higher, the, uh, the higher the probability to be unpaired is at these positions. Yeah. So in, in, the, uh, in the structure prediction algorithm, um, We've seen that before um, the secondary structures are decomposed into different loops. Yeah? And uh, the, the most, imp uh, the most um, contributing um, loops to the free energy are the space pair stacks. Yeah? And um, so the, the um, immediate idea might be that whenever we see a stack here, the four nucleotides here are involved, or so every four nucleotides, they are involved in forming a, a stack. We simply add uh, pseudo energies um, proportional to, uh, to the um, reactivity yeah, to destabilize these stacks in the algorithm. Yeah, so to reduce the free energy contribution of those stacks. And uh, so what, what you would end up then here is that uh, at the end of helix, helices, you have these four nucleotides here contributing, and uh, within a helix, yeah, um, you, you, for, for this stack, you have those four nucleotides contributing, for that stack, you have those here. So within the, uh, the helices, um, all the individual positions and reactivities are counted twice, while at the end of helices, you only incorporate the reactivity term that's down here um, once. Yeah, so this is the, the general idea by Deegan et al. And um, a second approach was then developed a couple of years later by Zering Hallam et al, where they said, okay, we, we don't only consider stacked pairs and destabilize them, but we simply add, uh, take all the information, yeah, so the pairedness or the unpairedness that we obtain from the experiment, and uh, add them, uh, add this information um, as um, pseudo energies to all the different nucleotides and conformations that are uh, covered in prediction algorithms. So whenever you form, uh, whenever the prediction algorithm considers those nucleotides here unpaired, you add a particular contribution that corresponds to the likelihood um, that the experiment agrees with that, while whenever you form base pairs, um, you do the exact same, but take the, um, take the 
likelihood from um, or, yeah, or the probability from um, experimental data that these particular nucleotides are actually forming a, uh, a base <coughs> pair or a, are actually paired. And then there are more sophisticated methods. I won't go into detail too much about, uh, for, for this function. So um, Bashid et al. And this, uh, in 2012, they, um, they simply um, said that um, if you do that, yeah, if, you, if you add these pseudo energy terms, yeah, then you might introduce artificial errors. Yeah, because if you, if you have some, some probing reactivities, you convert um, these reactivities into pseudo energy terms, and then you include that into uh, secondary structure prediction. And so whenever you evaluate substructures in the prediction, um, you add some pseudo energy terms on top of that. But maybe this is wrong. Yeah? Maybe the prediction for particular parts of the structure are, um, are good anyway. Yeah? So maybe they, total, uh, they, they, they don't need to be adjusted yeah? because the, the, the um, regular dynamic programming um, approach already computes the correct structure for certain parts. And so the idea here was that um, if, you, if you consider the uh, probing reactivity a more or less probability to be unpaired, we could try to find out an optimal pseudo energy term that we need to apply in each of the different steps um, that drives the prediction um, towards the probability um, of the, of the uh, experimental data. Yeah? Because you have, if, um, if, you, if you do st secondary structure prediction, you can, um, you can obtain base pairing probabilities. We've seen that before with the partition function approach. And you have the experimental data that also gives you something like a probability to be paired or a probability to be unpaired. And what you can then do is you can uh, try to find out what might be the optimal pseudo energy terms that I need to apply in order to make both probabilities as close uh, 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 yeah, uh, the same. Yeah? So the, how can we minimize the discrepancy between the prediction and the experiment? Yeah? So this is the general idea. Yeah? So here we have uh, predicted pairing probabilities, experimental pairing probabilities, and, uh, and then some, some um, adjusting and scaling factors in here. And um, in, the end we uh, in the end, we want to obtain um, some, some pseudo energy terms. This is the vector of pseudo energies. Um, here, this epsilon, and uh, this should be, um, yeah, and, yeah, we, we obtain this by minimizing that, uh, that right part. Yeah? So this is more, um, a more sophisticated, more or less, approach. And um, if you, if you uh, compare all of those three methods on how to incorporate shape data, then uh, for particular benchmark sets, you would see um, something like that. So uh, here I, uh, I've shown the uh, positive predictive value improvement. So the, um, the, the positive predictive value is the uh, proportion of the, pre uh, of the correctly predicted base pairs to all of the base pairs that have been predicted. Yeah, so the higher the positive predictive value, the closer the prediction is on, uh, uh, to, the, to the actual reference structure that you have. And, uh, and then I have here uh, three colors for the three different methods, Stegen, Nadal, Sering, Hellam, and Waschittel. And uh, we had a, a we have here uh, a set of uh, particular reference structures where people have uh, done the shape experiment and people um, came up with some um, reference structures, that how the structure should actually look like. And then you, you simply predict the structures and you see that um, in most cases, um, the, um, the incorporation of the probing data um, produces better predictions. I mean, this is what we expected. This is why we actually um, did this approach. But uh, there are situations where, the pro uh, where incorporating the probing experiment can make your prediction actually very worse. Yeah? So um, you, you always have to, to keep those situations in mind. Yeah? That this can also lead to the total different um, situation. Yeah? And uh, the, um, the predictions here that are highlighted with the uh, red background, those, for example, um, are 
RNAs um, that form pseudonauts, and also the reference structures have pseudonauts in, um, in, um, in their structure, and uh, all the predictions here have been done without pseudonauts. Yeah, so with uh, algorithms that can't predict pseudonauts. And so the, the problem is that, first of all, the prediction method can't produce pseudonauts. Therefore, um, uh, it's not so likely that the prediction um, gets very close to the, the reference structure. And second of all, the, um, the probing experiment might probe all the pseudonaut interactions as well. And this might be uh, a bad idea um, when you convert those reactivities into, energy, uh, in, into pseudo energies um, later on. Yeah? So I've written that here. Anyway, yeah, so um, when, you, uh, when you have a look at the uh, probing experiments and what you can gain from that is that in general, you could say that experimental data can substantially improve your prediction. Yeah? And um, then there are um, these high throughput methods that are very, very popular, that, that are also quite cheap nowadays um, to, uh, to probe many, many different RNAs in parallel or even entire uh, genomes uh, at once and so on and so forth. Um, and you, can, you could even perform many different probing experiments with different probing um, chemicals or enzymatic probing and chemical probing and so on and so forth. And then take all that data together to come up with a consensus model that fits all the different probing um, experiment or all the different probing data. And um, then there are methods such as shape map um, that, um, that mutates positions um, that are unpaired or that are accessible actually to the, to the probing ligand. And so when, when you sequence um, the RNA after the probing, you would get mutations in your sequence um, wherever the RNA was flexible. Yeah? And if you have multiple of those, um, of those muta mutations on a single RNA transcript, you can be sure that because this RNA uh, at a particular time when it was probed adopted one particular structure, that those two positions that had been modified were, um, were unpaired or flexible um, within the same secondary structure that, that was formed. Yeah? So, so you get some, some um, good ideas on, on how the, the structure might, uh, might look like. But um, what you always have to keep in mind is that um, these probing reactivities um, are prone to several errors, or you can, uh, you can make a lot of errors if you incorporate probing data. Because, um, first of all, um, if you do the probing experiment, even within the same lab, with the same exact, uh, exact protocol, yeah, then um, the probing data that you derive from that for the same RNA, same protocol, might be totally different. Yeah? So th this is very, um, very, um, prone to, to errors yeah? and might differ um, if you compare the, um, the, the exact same experiments. Then um, the second problem is that um, some of those probing methods might have very poor discriminative power. Yeah? And by that I mean that, um, for example, the shape reagent, yeah? this, is, uh, this probes the flexibility of the backbone. Yeah? And then the assumption is simply flexible, unpaired. Yeah? But this is actually not true, yeah? because if you look at the probing data for, uh, for reference structures, yeah? so you have uh, an RNA sequence where you are know pretty, uh, pretty well how the, the structure of that thing looks like, and you look at the probing data, then there are unpaired positions that, uh, that have very, very low reactivity, while there might also be some more or less paired um, regions that have higher probing reactivity. So the, the probing signal cannot really discriminate between this is unpaired and this is paired. Uh, so this is much more complicated. Yeah? So in, in, uh, for example, in a, in a hairpin loop, yeah, uh, something like, yeah, something like that, so we have here, and if you look at the pro, uh, probing data for all the nucleotides here, then maybe the, uh, the, the flexibility for those nucleotides um, is less than the fl uh, flexibility of this particular nucleotide. Yeah, so, um, so you would obtain here a lower reactivity compared 
to there. And this picture can totally change if you, uh, for, for instance, look at bulged loops. Yeah? So if you have something like that, yeah, a helix, and then there is a small nucleotide bulging out that would be considered unpaired in our prediction methods. This might be very rigid and, and has no flexibility at all, and therefore the probing, uh, the probing experiment would simply predict that as being paired. Yeah, and so, um, so the, the probing reagents are usually not discriminative uh, or have uh, little discriminative power. And, um, yeah, then um, another very important thing that one ha always has to keep in mind is that usually we do not do single molecule probing. Uh, usually we have a solution of many RNA molecules and we probe them and then we obtain some data from that. But if we have uh, an ensemble of RNAs, many different RNA strands, um, then um, the, the different RNA strands might, um, uh, might, might be in different conformations. So we are always probing an ensemble of secondary structures or an ensemble of structures. Uh, so we have a, 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 super, a superposition of all the different flexibilities over all the possible structures that are uh, present in solution. And, um, and then also what, uh, what we usually probe yeah, is um, we uh, probe not only the secondary structure, but we also probe pseudonauts. I mentioned that shortly before. We uh, probe other tertiary interactions. Yeah, yesterday, uh, uh, during, the, uh, during your presentations, we heard about this A minor interaction. This is tertiary structure interaction that's not considered at all in secondary structure prediction, but um, doing the probing experiment, we would um, see those positions maybe uh, paired. So what, can, uh, what does that mean for us? Yeah, so we always have to be very cautious when we uh, in, incorporate probing data because um, first of all, we have to see that the reactivity preparation is robust. Yeah, to, uh, for example, if you have many different um, experiments, yeah, we need some very good statistical approaches on how do we actually um, get from the experimental data to something that's more or less a reactivity or pseudo energy term. Yeah. Um, then we need tools that, uh, that are flexible with respect of inclusion of the data. Yeah. So we need tools that are able to add um, additional constraints, pseudo energies, to particular um, types of, of uh, structural motives. Yeah. And many programs um, only consider this one thing, for example, a helix that can be penalized or unpaired nucleotides that can be penalized. But, um, but depending on the experimental data that you want to use, we would, uh, we would really like to have a tool that can, do, uh, can incorporate um, the data in many different ways, in many different parts of the, of the prediction. And, uh, and then the, uh, the large problem with the uh, probing of the ensemble of confirmations is that the probing data um, actually requires deconvolution, yeah? because we have the superimposition of all the different structures that were in solution. And um, if we simply incorporate the probing data for a particular position, um, then we can't be sure um, that, uh, that this data actually reflects it now the pairedness or unpairedness of that position. Because in maybe 50% of the structures, this position was paired. In the other 50% of structures that were probed, this position was unpaired. Yeah, so paired and unpaired, and so the signal would maybe say, okay, pff, I don't know anything about that position, or that position is maybe unpaired, yeah, depending on the uh, on the uh, probing experiment, and um, and this might totally distort the prediction. Yeah. Okay. Um, Based on that, um, I, I've already used the term constraint before. Yeah? So we will see um, that uh, later in the afternoon when we do uh, the, or when we come to the hands-on session. Yeah? So um, we, we need tools that are, are capable to incorporate many, many different types of constraints. Yeah? from, for, for instance, experimental data. And um, if you, if you uh, look at constraints, or if you think about what types of constraints can we add in the, in the uh, prediction programs, you could think of hard, or more or less hard constraints, and soft constraints. And uh, the hard constraints are actually things like uh, binary decisions. Yeah? So hard constraints would say, um, this particular nucleotide must be unpaired 
or this particular nucleotide must be paired. Yeah? And there's no other way. I will never, uh, so the prediction program must never um, consider any other state of that particular nucleotide. This is a hard constraint. Yeah? So this, um, uh, this allows or allows or enforces um, certain parses of the decomposition scheme, these arc schemes that we've seen before. And uh, by that, we can add or remove particular substructures from the candidates that you want to evaluate. While soft constraints are uh, constraints that are uh, not so rigid, but more, are more guiding the prediction. Yeah? That's why they are soft. They are usually expressed in terms of pseudo energies, some extra energies that we take into account, uh, or probabilities. Yeah? So, um, because if you only have like 60% that this particular nucleotide is unpaired, uh, um, we don't want to actually force that binary, yeah? but we want to include the probability somehow in the prediction. So we can modify the energy contributions for particular decomposition steps and thereby, uh, thereby stabilize or de destabilize particular substructures. And um, this idea is not that new. Yeah? Um, this has been used for, for a very long time since the first um, prediction algorithms for secondary structures. And, um, but most of them, they, they, are, uh, they had been implemented for particular use cases. So one program had a particular type of constraints built in that they could activate or deactivate. And um, so, this is the, the overview. And in the vnRNA package that we want to use in the hands-on session, we have a very, very uh, generic implementation where you can uh, where you can incorporate almost all the different um, constraints that you can, can think of that are compatible with the secondary structure prediction paradigm. Uh, we got, we're going to see that in uh, in the afternoon. And um, what is the idea behind that? So if we consider this. Um, this Nusinov decomposition scheme again, you've seen that extensively before, yeah? then we could, uh, if you convert that into some uh, recursive formulas, yeah? the recursive formula for that might look like that. So we have an energy from N, uh, I to J and the term where, um, oops, yeah, where this i is unpaired, and then the term where i is paired with some k. And if you convert that into this formula, we have um, this, this part where, where we have the i unpaired. Yeah? So we take the, simply take the energy from i plus 1 to j and add an energy contribution for that particular i that, uh, that remains unpaired. Yeah? This might be 0, yeah? for, for instance. Um, and um, and this xii here, this is simply a Boolean um, variable that tells us whether or not we want to take this contribution into account. So this might be 0 or 1, yeah? and this is 0 if i must never be unpaired, yeah? or this is 1 if we don't care, if i may, may be unpaired. Yeah? So this is a Boolean value that simply determines whether or not we take the contribution of that particular conformation into account. <coughs> and the same is true for the right side. Yeah? So we have these, um, these contributions for the included part and the uh, remainder, and then we have the contribution for that base pair here. Yeah? This is over here. Then we, again, we have a multiplicati uh, multi multiplicative uh, a factor, a binary factor that simply tells us: um, Do we take this? Uh, do we take this conformation into account, or don't we? Yeah, so, depending on whether or not this is zero or one, and uh, so these are the, the uh, parts where we can um, where we can introduce constraints. Yeah, because these things here, these axes, they are hard constraints. Yeah, they allow us to take that uh, confirmation or disallow it, while th the, only, um, the only soft constraining part are these energies here yeah, that we might modify. And this is what we have implemented. So we simply express these axes here um, in terms of a Boolean function that depends on maybe many different nucleotide positions. Yeah? For instance, if we, um, if we go beyond the Nusinov model, then if we yeah, if we have an interior loop that has an enclosing base pair and an enclosed base pair here, we have positions i and j, p and q, and in, within here we have 
particular of unpaired nucleotides, then we take, uh, then in order to make a hard constraint for that particular configuration, we need one, two, three, four nucleotide positions. Yeah, so this is, uh, this is this part here, and D are the many different decompositions that can be, uh, that can be done within the uh, recursions, and then we simply assign a Boolean value here for the hard constraints. And we do the exact same thing for the soft constraints. Again, we evaluate particular loops. They depend on particular positions. Yeah, to determine the energy, and then we add some additional real value, some pseudo energy on top of that. And we've, uh, and we've implemented that in the vnRNA package, and we, we're gonna use that in, in the afternoon. Okay, so let's continue, um, or let's go away from guiding the predictions to actually extending um, the secondary structure model. Yeah? Because sometimes um, it's not possible to, to do anything with the constraints. Yeah? So for instance, if you have a RNA-RNA um, interaction or ligand interaction, particular aptamer fold and the ligand binds to that, then we, we, we can't do any, uh, or we can't do that much with, with constraints, but we need to extend the secondary structure model. Yeah? And this is where um, pseudonauts are part of, yeah? to incorporate pseudonauts, one has to, um, one has to extend the prediction model, the decomposition scheme, and um, Ivo already had a slide on that in the first, uh, in the first session. So, um, if you have a, sec a secondary structure, there might be conformations where um, a hairpin loop actually forms additional base pairs with some downstream um, unpaired paired position here, and then you end up with some H-type pseudonaut, and there are more complicated things. So for instance, here again, you have this um, kissing hairpins, so two hairpins that form um, base pairs to, um, to, to st further stabilize the structure. There are many different um, pseudonauts found in nature, if you pr probe or analyze structures. And uh, so they are, they are actually quite common, yeah, because they help the RNA to get a more compact form in 3D. Yeah? And, uh, but um, when, whenever we do predictions, we usually leave them out. But we do not leave them out because they are uncommon. We leave them out because um, the, the algorithmic complexity um, increases. So the, the, we, we need more effort to actually do the predictions. And uh, in fact, you also already mentioned that this is an, an NP-hard problem um, for arbitrary complex pseudonauts. And, um, and also a large problem is that um, only a very small number of energy models exist. Because when, uh, whenever we want to allow a confirmation like that, we need to assign an energy term for that, for the prediction. But um, what does that energy term actually depend on? Does that depend on all the different sequence uh, nucleotides within that loop and, uh, and then so on and so forth? This is usually very sensitive to ionic concentrations. Yeah? The higher the magnesium concentration, the more likely it is that the pseudonode is actually formed. Yeah, so there, there are many also tertiary um, um, interact or, or tertiary factors that contribute to the stability of the pseudonaut interaction. And this is more or less unclear on how to best model that in the secondary structure paradigm or something that's extending the secondary structure paradigm to, um, to take uh, pseudonauts into account. So what have people been doing um, to still consider pseudonauts in the prediction algorithm. So um, in order to, um, to get rid of this NP-hardness for arbitrarily complex pseudonauts, um, people have been um, developed um, extensions of these decomposition schemes um, that only cover particular types of pseudonauts. For instance, only H-type pseudonauts, or only H-type pseudonauts and kissing hairpins. Something like that. If you reduce the, this uh, particular conformations, then you might end up with some uh, more or less efficient dynamic programming approaches that are then not um, in, uh, ca that cannot be solved in cubic time, but maybe in uh, n to the fourth or n to the five or n to the sixth. Yeah? Um, but that, uh, with those algorithms, you could still analyze more or less short RNA sequences and predict. Um, 
structures with pseudonauts. And um, if you do that, um, if you restrict that to particular subclasses and then uh, come up with a dynamic programming algorithm, this is called ab initio. Yeah? So um, you do that within the prediction, yeah? right while predicting. While um, another approach that one could consider here is a more or less heuristic approach. So you first, uh, you first predict many, many different secondary structures without pseudonauts, and then you analyze how could you make those structures more compact? How could you actually introduce pseudonauts into those structures? So for instance, you've predicted those two hairpins here, and you find, okay, these orange parts here, they are unpaired anyway, but they are perfectly complementary. So um, maybe we can simply introduce here um, some kissing hairpin interaction. Yeah, so you, uh, you more or less consider that a two-step process. First, you um, first you predict the secondary structure, and then the um, pseudonaut interaction takes place. And this is a posteriori. A posteriori um, yeah. So, um, I, due to time constraints, I will not go in, uh, in more detail um, for, for pseudonauts, um, unfortunately. But um, I'm, I'm pretty sure that during that week and also uh, during the, um, during the hands-on session, we, we can um, answer many questions that might arise um, with respect to, to pseudonauts. <coughs> okay, let's go on yeah, and look at another extension of, uh, of the secondary structure prediction paradigm. And in that case, um, I want to show you on how can we model more complex interactions. Right now, we only, had, uh, we only considered canonical base pairs um, and secondary structure formation. Yeah, so canonical base pairs are always Watson-Crick base pairs. And uh, in, the, in the following part, I want to show you how, we, uh, how one can um, add more complex motifs for in, uh, in that Example, I've chosen the G quadruplexes that were mentioned before. Yeah? So what, for those of you who don't know what G quadruplexes are, yeah, so G quadruplexes are simply structural conformations that, uh, that arise when, when the RNA sequence, or also DNA, so they are common in both nucleic acids, um, when, uh, when you have uh, larger or G-rich sequences that follow a particular form. You have um, uh, G runs, so-called so G runs. So you have consecutive Gs, in, uh, sp uh, spaced by arbitrary nucle uh, nucleotide sequence parts that are rather short. Yeah? So uh, you have, um, for instance, um, L yeah, might be two or three Gs consecutively, then you have an arbitrary number of other nucleotides, and then again three or four Gs, and so on and so forth. And so you have, a, uh, have this kind of pattern with those four runs of Gs, and they can, in 3D, stack uh, or form structures that more or less look like that. So um, different, uh, yeah, every G in those different um, runs um, forms a more or less planar G quartet, and then those G quartets can stack on top of each other to form, uh, to form a more or less barrel-like structure. Yeah? And uh, so this, this looks more or less like that. So we have the five prime end here, then you have three Gs, then the yellow part is this arbitrary sequence, and then again we have three Gs and so on and so forth. And, uh, and here you see in blue, um, I hope everybody can see that, um, in, in blue we have um, hydrogen bonds, base pairing interactions between those four Gs in one plane. Yeah? And uh, they can be oriented in parallel, so um, the, the, um, this linker sequence here um, goes down again every time, or um, we, this, they can um, form in, in anti-parallel or even mixed, and so on and so forth. And if you uh, if you look at the individual layers here, um, we see that um, these four uh, guanines they form Hookstein-Watson-Crick bonds to actually uh, come up with this quartet-like configuration. Yeah. And, um, and the stacking interaction here, um, this is depicted here with, this, uh, with these donuts, the blue donuts here, the, um, the, these are the stabilizing pi orbital um, overlaps between the different guanines, and they are very, very stable. Yeah. And um, compared to regular secondary structures, so compared to um, helices, regular double-stranded helices, yeah, they're, they're much more stable. And um, 
yeah, where, where do we find the, uh, those, those quadruplexes? I already mentioned that. Um, they are common in uh, both nucleic acids, DNA and RNA. Uh, um, so for, for instance, in human telomeres, there are many of those G runs that form um, DNA G quadruplexes. Some promoter regions um, are known to, to con uh, contain G quadruplexes where um, if, the, if the DNA um, is, uh, is molten um, for, for being accessible maybe for transcription, and and um, if in the promoter region of that, um, of that um, downstream gene or so, um, there's a G quadruplex, then this G quadruplex prevents the uh, re-annealing of the double strands. Yeah, so, the, uh, so the gene um, stays more accessible for a longer time because the G quadruplex prevents the DNA to form the double helix again, even if there are no proteins left that uh, actively keep the, uh, the DNA strands um, separate. And um, in RNAs, um, there are also a couple of G quadruplexes and, uh, um, known, yeah, and uh, mainly um, G quadruplexes in, in RNAs um, reg uh, modulate translation. Yeah, so um, in, uh, if you have a G quadruplex in the five prime UTR of a protein coding gene, then um, this might result in, uh, in very low translation efficiency because the entire machinery, the entire translation machinery, ribosome and so on and so forth, cannot attach to the, uh, to the RNA or maybe not proceed to the actual coding part of the mRNA, while when the G quadruplex is located in the free prime UTR, this might help to stabilize the RNA and prevent it from degradation because you have many, uh, many um, exonucleases that, uh, that start digesting the RNA from the free prime site and they might get stuck at the G quadruplex in the free prime UTR and therefore the RNA prolongs a little bit longer within the cell. Yeah, so there are many modulating facts. And also um, um, some G quadruplexes have been found with encoding sequences and they might be recognized by proteins and uh, help in localization of the mRNA within the cell. Yeah. Okay, so this is the, the biological background for that. Now let's come to how can we actually incorporate those things into secondary structure prediction? Well, if you look in, uh, in more closely to the, uh, at the G quadruplexes, we see that these G quadruplexes are local closed structures. They have a five prime end, they have a three prime end, and in between they form those stacked layers uh, and nothing more. Yeah, so all these linkers, they are unpa considered unpaired. So this is a compact structure with a, uh, with a five prime and a three prime end. And so we, uh, we can think of um, treating them as, uh, as other substructures. Yeah, so it doesn't matter whether or not in the, our prediction we incorporate a helix or we incorporate a quadruplex yeah, that starts at the position I and J. Yeah. And, um, what, uh, what's also nice is that if you have a particular sequence, yeah, you can scan for, the, for these G runs yeah, and potential G quadruplex forming sites in linear time. You simply go over your sequence and find out all the different positions where a G quadruplex motif is found. Yeah? And then for each of those motifs, you can already evaluate um, the energy for those G quadruplexes if you have a good energy model. Of course, yeah. But you, so so you can do a lot of pre-processing and then take all these uh, this data in the prediction algorithm or put that into the prediction algorithm. So we have seen this figure before again. So this is the regular secondary structure prediction. And if we want to incorporate the G quadruplexes now, we simply have to think of um, where do we have to put in all those G quadruplexes here? Yeah. Sorry, may I ask a Yeah, but uh, sometimes uh, loops in G quadruplexes can incorporate uh, their own hairpins. So you can have G quadruplexes and inside it uh, there will be hairpin. Thus it becomes like pseudo not problem. Mm -hmm. So it should be even more uh, complex. And another question is uh, when you evaluate <clears throat> The energy, uh, some G quadruplexes can have different topologies, and uh, because of that, they will have different stacking patterns, thus, yeah. the energies can vary greatly. So, how can you mm -hmm. estimate these? Yeah, I go, I'm gonna go into that topic um, within a minute or so. Yeah, I, uh, I will address that. Yeah. So, um, 
So for, maybe one, one of those things I can uh, answer before. So um, for RNA, for a long, very long time, for RNA, it, uh, it has been, um, uh, our GQA triplexes have been considered to mostly um, form the, the anti-parallel no, parallel confirmation, uh, the parallel confirmation. Um, um, there, there are a couple of pa papers um, that appeared in, in recent times, or so last year, this year, um, where people have actually shown that um, even RNA can, um, can or RNA-G quadruplexes can be much more diverse in, in terms of orientation of the strands. But um, the most diversity has had been found in DNA before. And so um, what I will show you here is uh, mostly considers RNA and uh, also the, you, you'll see um, the, the energy model in a, in a minute or so, um, uh, where we also ne totally neglect any um, structures that are formed by the, by the linkers. Yeah? So we, we only assume that the G quadruplex is a very simple thing, closed structure. Yeah? Okay, again, this was the um, decomposition scheme for secondary structure. If we want to incorporate the G quadruplexes now, we have to extend that. And I mentioned that before, um, we simply treat it like any, any other substructure. So we simply have to look at where do we add substructures here. And this is everywhere where we have this C things here. Yeah? A substructure was closed by a base pair. And so we simply extend that scheme by introducing um, additional rules where we incorporate the quadruplex as a module. Yeah? And so these black things here, these are our quadruplexes. So here you see that pretty clear, uh, either we make a base pair from I to K or we make a quadruplex from I to K. Yeah? And the same is true for all the different um, parts of the, of the decomposition scheme. And then um, depending on how we incorporate that, um, it might be necessary to include an additional um, triangular matrix, dy dy dynamic programming matrix, where we simply store the evaluated energies for all the different possible ends of a quadruplex. Yeah? And by doing so, we already um, have the quadruplex as a separate unit in our prediction model. Now the question is, how do we score them? Yeah, so this is, of course, a very large question. Yeah, but fortunately, um, in 2011, there was a group that, uh, that measured different RNA uh, quadruplexes by UV melting. So they, uh, they actually came up with melting temperatures where from, from which you can determine free energy terms. Uh, and they, they um, did a couple of experiments. I think it was like 40 or so experiments, different um, linker sequences, um, um, different linker sequence compositions, and different, different linker sequence lengths. And if you um, draw all those free energy terms that were derived from the experiment um, in, in, in this 2D, uh, representation where on the x-axis you denote the total linker length, so the number of nucleotides um, in the linkers. Yeah? You simply add the, uh, un uh, the unpaired nucleotides for all the three different linkers. Um, and on the y-axis you have the free energy. This more or less looks like a logarithmic curve. And indeed, um, you could... Uh, if, if this assumption would hold, if this is logarithmic, you, would, uh, you could say, okay, we make a very simple model, very simple energy model. Yeah? So the, um, from, from polymer theory, you would, uh, you would say that um, somehow the destabilizing effect of the linkers contributes logarithmically with the linker length. Yeah? So this is, um, we, we, the energy must somehow be proportional to the total linker length. Uh, um, possibly logarithmic, and, um, and the stabilizing effect of the G quadruplex are actually the pi layer, uh, the pi orbital layers um, in, in, the, in the stacks. Uh, and, um, and therefore, the energy must be proportional to the number of layers minus one that we have. Uh, because we have, if you have two layers, then there's one interaction between those two layers. If you have three layers, we have two stabilizing interaction. So these are the simplifying assumptions that we have in here. And we then simply assume um, linker asymmetry does not play any role. Linker sequence does not play any role. There is no structure within the linker. Everything of that um, we simply neglect. So um, the energy model might, uh, might only depend on the number of layers, capital L, the linker length, lowercase l, 
uh, the total Inca length, and some temperature. Uh, and, um, and so the, the energy here um, might be a scaling factor uh, that depends on the temperature times the number of stacking interactions that we have, plus some destabilizing interaction um, times the logarithm of the total linker length. Uh, so this is, the, this is our energy model. And then um, for, to actually fit the parameters A over time and then T um, over time, yeah, we, uh, we need to take this data into account and uh, we did that. We, yeah, so as I mentioned, so now we have a very, very uh, simple energy model yeah, that we want to test in the end. And um, so, but we need to parameterize that. And uh, in order to do that, we used um, this, um, the data from, from the, uh, these UV melting experiments and um, fitted our model into that data. Yeah? And you can see here that this fits more or less nicely. Yeah? So it, um, it's not that off. Uh, the data, and um, actually, if you if you do um, melting temperature predictions with our implementation, yeah, so with that model, yeah, um, you would see that the melting temperatures of the experiment um, are actually, um, or the melting temperatures that you would predict with our model are very close to the melting temperatures that were obtained in the experiment. Yeah? This is what, what you can see here. So we simply con conclude that, okay, this simple energy model works well with the data that was analyzed in that experiment. And therefore we simply say, okay, um, this might be sufficient to include um, G quadruplexes into the, um, into the structure prediction. And therefore um, actually modeling the competition of helix formation and quadruplex formation. Yeah? So because this is in the end what we want to do. Yeah? We do not only want to uh, scan for particular motifs where quadruplex could be formed, because this particular um, subsequence might be involved in a very stable helix. Yeah? And we want to know whether or not the G quadruplex, um, e even though it's possible from sequence side, um, actually um, forms in um, if you consider the structure. Yeah? And so we, um, we implemented that, uh, of course, also in the VNRNA package. So we have many, many different programs that implement this particular energy, uh, simple model yeah, and the parameterization. And so we have RNA fold for um, single sequence predictions. Um, we can compute probabilities of the quadruplexes, yeah, all, all these kind of things. We have that for RNA Ali fold where we can do consensus structure prediction given a sequence alignment. And we can incorporate those uh, G quadruplexes in order to invest investigate whether or not a particular G quadruplex position is uh, maybe evolutionary conserved, uh, structurally uh, structure-wise. Um, we have RNA cofold, where interaction of two RNAs takes place and um, the, the single strands can form quadruplexes. <coughs> Unfortunately, we don't have intermolecular um, G quadruplex formation in our model um, because we don't have any data on that. Yeah? So we don't know that much on, on how the, the influence is if you have two strands forming the quadruplex, three strands, four strands, uh, individual ones. We, we don't have the data for that. And we have uh, local scanning variants, so local folding um, algorithms that also in, can incorporate um, quadruplexes. So we have, for, for instance, um, RNA L fold and RNA L Ali fold where you can do entire, uh, where, where you can scan entire genomes. Yeah? like gigabases of, gen uh, of genomes for local structure formation and putative quadruplex positions within the genomes. Uh, so and we, um, we also analyzed that before. And now I want to show you an example um, what, you can, uh, what you can actually do with th these kind of models. Here I have the human telomerase RNA component. So this is the, the RNA that's part of the, the telomerase and um, this RNA, uh, telomerase RNA component um, is known to form a quadruplex at the, uh, at the five prime end, this RNA. And um, so this is depicted here. And, uh, but this, this quadruplex is not always present. Yeah, so um, so uh, some um, RNAs in, in the cell, also depending maybe on, on ion concentrations and other factors, um, have this quadruplex at the five prime positions and others don't. And what does that mean? So in, um, in, 
if you, if you have the G quadruplex here, then the, the entire structure of the, this RNA looks, looks more or less like that, while if the quadruplex is not formed in the beginning, then this part of the sequence here, this green part, is very accessible. Yeah, so this is um, very um, accessible in terms of being unpaired. And uh, in fact, this part is actually um, a, um, uh, a recognition motif for the, uh, for, for the telomeres. Yeah, this is the part that is used as a template to uh, uh, attach to the, to the telomeres and then uh, perform the telomer uh, telomerase um, uh, function. So if this uh, if the G quadruplex is formed, then um, this se sequence part here is not, uh, not that much um, accessible, while, um, while it's accessible um, if the G quadruplex is missing. And we wanted to investigate that, yeah? so um, we simply predicted the secondary structure for this RNA with and without G quadruplex support, and what you can see here is that um, in, in that example, this yellow part here would be the site where the G quadruplex can form. Yeah? And um, of course, if we don't incorporate G quadruplexes, we would simply predict that at, as part of a helix. Yeah? And uh, while if we incorporate G quadruplexes, we nicely see here, more or less cartoonish, uh, in a hairpin-like form, um, the G quadruplex forming. And if you look into that a little bit closer, yeah? so you, here again you have the um, this G quadruplex part uh, and, um, and this um, recognition motif here. And um, if you look at the accessibility probabilities that we would predict uh, in the model that includes quadruplexes and the model that does not include um, quadruplexes, uh, we see that um, if the quadruplex is formed, uh, the, um, the probability of being unpaired um, yeah, is less for that, for, for that motive part um, than, um, than if the quadruplex would not form. Yeah, and, um, yeah exactly. Yeah, so if the, that, that, was the, that was the model. Yeah? So if the quadruplex is formed, uh, then, um, then the, the uh, RNA cannot be used as a template to anneal um, to, the, um, to, to the DNA and perform the telomerase. Um, so and this is quite nice because now we can model that computationally yeah, these things, and we can we could even look at uh, at the probabilities of those uh, of the quadruplex formation. Um, I don't have a picture on that, but um, the probability in that example is about 60 percent. So 60 percent of the um, energy weighted structures in the entire ensemble actually exhibit those uh, this quadruplex, and 40 percent don't. And this this was also a very nice indication on uh, on um, on that this quadruplex might be easily um, controlled through external factors. Yeah, so because if this is more or less 50, 60 percent or so, then with external factors you could destabilize or stabilize the quadruplex quite easily and therefore um, induce um, really large changes in, in structure. All right, and now I come to um, my last part, uh, uh, the last slide for G quadruplexes. Um, so G quadruplexes are very important. Um, we already, uh, we've heard about that. They are straightforward to implement. Um, we, we simply used a very um, simple energy model to do that. Um, we, uh, I already mentioned that we did some uh, genome-wide screens, so we can look at where in the genome, um, in, if we would predict local structures, um, a G quadruplex might form. And um, sometimes they are even conserved across species. Yeah? You can, can invest, investigate, uh, investigate these things. And actually, well, the, the idea that I've shown here yeah, could apply to other 2.5D motifs as well. So not only G quadruplexes, if you have other motifs where you can uh, use uh, experimental data to, to get a glimpse on the energy uh, of, this, this, the, the, of this data, you could um, use the exact same procedure to incorporate your, um, your own um, two and a half D motive. The problem, and this refers to your question again, is um, yeah, we, we, um, we don't have any, um, or we didn't model any complexity in the G quadruplex. No structure in the linkers. Um, we don't have RNA-DNA interaction, for example, that would be required for also for telomerases. Yeah? So because then um, also the, the DNA and the RNA can form quite, um, um, 
intermolecular quadruplexes. We don't have um, RNA-RNA quadruplex interaction, unfortunately. We don't have DNA-G quadruplexes, and DNA-G uh, DNA quadruplexes are known to be very diverse in ter terms of topology, and of course this makes a lot of difference in terms of energies, uh, depending on what topology you have. And, uh, and then, um, maybe most importantly, we didn't model any ion concentrations in that model. Yeah? We simply assume we have a high enough potassium concentration for the quadruplex to actually form. Uh, and um, yeah, but, but one might be able to change the model slightly and incorporate the ion concentrations um, into the energy terms for the quadruplex. Uh, if you would have some data on that, one could do, do that. Um, unfortunately, one would then also need to um, incorporate the, energy, uh, the ion concentrations into the other energy terms, uh, because helix formation and so on and so forth also depends on the ion strength, ionic strength. Uh, okay, good. And um, last but not least, um, I think we have more fi five more mi minutes, maybe. I, can, I, I simply, uh, this is only, two or three slides. Yeah? So uh, another idea on how we can um, extend secondary structure prediction would be to maybe incorporate ligands. Yeah? So um, we might have an aptamer motif in, in, our, uh, in a particular structure and we have a small, chem, uh, small ligand that can bind to this aptamer motif or we have a protein, a single strand binding protein that uh, binds to unpaired regions in the, in the RNA. Yeah? And if you want to model those things, um, you. Um, and then maybe um, do some, some um, ensemble calculations. Yeah, we require the partition function again. Yeah, um, so we already heard about how to compute the partition function. We had a Z in, in Evo slides. Here it's a Q. Yeah, so it's simply the Boltzmann factors of all the different structures in the ensemble. And if you want to include a ligand yeah, with a particular dissociation constant that can be determined from, from experimental data and a particular concentration of that ligand, what, uh, in order to incorporate that into this partition function, one would um, add on top of all the secondary structures that are unbound, yeah. Um, one, have, uh, one needs to incorporate a constrained partition function QA. Yeah. QA is the partition function over all the secondary structures that exhibit the aptamer motif or that are, uh, that are unpaired at the particular motif position where the protein binds to. Yeah. So we in simply enforce the binding um, as, as, uh, in terms of a constraint uh, in, in this QA, and then we simply multiply that with the uh, dissociation constant divided by concentration. Yeah, and here again you see, this is the constraint partition function, QA. This is all the structures that have the motif A in their structure, yeah, the aptamer motif, or this particular region unpaired for the protein to actually attach. Yeah, um, of the Boltzmann factors. The problem is this only works if we um, if we have a single motif in our sequence, yeah? because if we uh, if, so if we have many more positions where a ligand might bind to, we need to um, incorporate all the different combinations. So consider two uh, two single uh, two single stranded regions where a protein binds to. Yeah? So um, it might be that the, uh, that, um, the protein binds only to the first one, or it only binds to the second position, or it binds to both of them. Yeah? And if you have three positions where the protein might bind to, yeah, this gets even worse. Yeah? So this, there's a combinatorial explosion on how many different um, um, constrained partition functions you would need to compute in order to model um, complex interactions with, with a ligand. And therefore, in order to solve this problem, um, if, um, one, one could think of um, explicitly modeling the ligand interaction in, in the secondary structure prediction again, and not using, uh, or not, uh, not using the, the con constraints, uh, the constraint partition functions. So we want to explicitly include that. And uh, like we've seen before with G quadruplexes, yeah, um, we could, for, for instance, if a protein binds single-stranded regions, we could um, add additional terms whenever there, um, the, the decomposition schemes um, considers a particular part unpaired. So for some in hairpins or interior loops and here these multi-branch loops, we, uh, we have consecutive uh, nucleotides that are considered unpaired explicitly in the recursions, but this is not all the different possibilities. Mainly, this is only hairpins and internal loops that could be considered here. And therefore, 
similar to the, uh, to the G quadruplex extensions, uh, we can incorporate or make this de decomposition scheme even larger and incorporate um, the ligand binding as, uh, in terms of additional cases of the decomposition scheme. And um, that's basically it. So um, ligand binding itself, if this is simple enough, um, can be uh, or may be dealt with using constraints. Um, most of the time, this, can't, uh, this is not true. Most of the time, we ha uh, one needs to explicitly model that um, in, in terms of extending the recursion scheme. The vnRNA package includes this extension, so we will also see that in the afternoon. Um, we can uh, either include hairpin or interior loop-like motifs through the soft constraints implementation, because there we simply need to um, change the evaluation of hairpins or these interior loops. Yeah, but um, if you want to have a single strand protein binding um, modeled in, in our predictions where the protein binds to any part that is unpaired, yeah, um, then we need this um, unstructured domains feature. The, the drawback here is that um, still, um, if, you, if you would model things like that, um, there, are, there are no cooperative effects <coughs> modeled in here. So this is some, some entire different, entirely different question. So if you have um, a binding mode where first a particular protein binds to, and then only then another protein might bind to, to the RNA, uh, these cooperative effects can't be modeled that easily. Uh, this is much more complicated. And um, also changes in the, the concentration of the, uh, of the ligands or proteins um, requires recomputation of the partition function that you would not have in, um, in models like here. Because if you change the concentration, you already know this QA, uh, you simply multiply these things here. While in, if you have the entire extension, you have to evaluate in this entire scheme at the different concentration. And that's it. Um, I'm looking forward to, to the hands-on session uh, later on. and I. Uh, I will try to show you as many things that we've seen theoretically here um, in, uh, uh, with, the, with the programs that, that, you, that you could use. Right. Thank you very much. So, so maybe we get time for a couple of questions and then afterward we'll maybe resume during the coffee break. Uh, is there any correlation between different shape for one RNA? Hmm? Uh, is there any correlation between different shape for one RNA? You mean shape experiments, the probing yeah, yeah, experiments? Uh, yeah, so for, for one particular RNA, um, yeah, I, I, I hope so. So if you compare um, experimental data um, that was obtained for, for the, the exact same RNA, maybe by different groups or in the same lab, um, Monday and Friday or so, um, that uh, I hope that there are correlations, but um, many experimentalists um, know about the, these, uh, about the issues that um, the, the, um, the probing data, the probing reactivity might be off for certain parts or, um, or yeah, might be different, yeah? because um, only the slightest change in the experiment m might lead to, uh, to something else in the probing, or maybe a truck go goes by the, the, uh, the lab on the street and, uh, and the bumping, uh, uh, and then the, the street uh, jiggles a little bit and so on, and therefore also some other things are measured in, uh, in the experiment that might be only very slight differences, but they might also be very large. Yeah? So. I don't. I, I think most of the time this should correlate you know, for the exact same RNA, but then um, there are cases where it doesn't. Something else is that also minor changes in the reactivities will change, um, uh, will have some impact on the pseudo free energies. Yeah, and, yeah. and it only takes a little yeah. change sometimes to completely yeah. change the predicted structures. So even though there is correlation, generally it's, it's still very noisy. Yeah. And how do you compute uh, the binding sites between the ligand and RNA? Uh, you showed a formula, mm -hmm. but uh, could you please explain it? Just so um, 
the, the uh, idea that I showed with the ligand binding is um, you already know um, potential binding sites. So you know the mode of interaction of your ligand and the RNA. Uh, um, this, th this knowledge might be very specific. So for example, for uh, an aptamer that binds a small chemical compound, um, the, this might be a very particular structure with a very particular sequence composition. But then um, for single strand binding proteins, for, for instance, it might be that um, the, the protein simply binds any RNA. Um, the, the only requirement would be that um, the, these positions are unpaired. Uh, so, um, no, but but no matter um, no matter what kind of mode you have here, you can apply the exact same principles. You simply scan for all the potential binding sites. Yeah, and then compute, for instance, the, the um, constraint partition function for all the different cases, or you, um, or you model that with the extension of the dynamic programming uh, scheme. Yeah, so if you have a single strand binding protein then, um, that binds anywhere where it's unpaired, then you simply have the possibility to bind the protein to any subsequence position. But it doesn't matter if you include that in the prediction algorithm. Yeah. 